What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Truth Life Podcast. We got a special guest today. We got Obi Imigano. I said I got it right. Yeah, <laughs> Obi Imigano, professional player in Spain right now. Um, I played him a couple of years ago. Well, I actually didn't play him. I think you were hurt when we played against uh, against y'all. Okay, okay. And I missed it, but um, you was in the scouting report, but you didn't play against us. But you know, a talented player. Uh, been watching him for the last three years, and so excited that you know he's able to grace us with his information today on the podcast. So, if you can, bro, just give us a small background of who you are, where you come from, and let the people get familiar with you. Uh, all right. Well, like you said, I'm Obi Megano, um, born in Nigeria, raised up in the States, um, in Oklahoma, Edmond, Oklahoma City. Um, this is my fifth year pro. I played in Italy, a little bit in Poland. It's been three years in France, and now this is my first year in Spain in the ACB. Um, also playing with the national Nigerian national team. So uh, that'll be nice. We've got a next window coming up next month in February. So uh, yeah, that's me. Got you. So uh, born in Nigeria, raised in Oklahoma. Uh, what was that transition like coming from Nigeria? Was you always raised in America or was you born in Nigeria and moved when you was like a kid to America? Yeah, so I was born in Nigeria uh, when I was three. I was young, I moved to the States. Um, so, you know, it was, it was uh, I didn't really remember much, obviously, but growing up that way, man, I, my parents are very, traditional, um, very traditional parents. You know, we were all born in the in Nigeria, except for my mom. She was born in the UK. Okay. So she's got that British side to her, but uh, she's still Nigerian traditional as well. Um, but yeah, growing up in that in, in that household, you know, morals and things like that. And it, it's just a little bit different from a lot of Americans that grew up, you know, so uh, I'm happy. I'm happy about that. It's I think it made me who I am today, uh, set my core values at a, at a certain place. So, um, yeah. Yeah, it's just crazy um, talking to Nigerian. One of my best friends is a uh, Nigerian, Suleiman Bremo. Uh, okay. Being around him, one of my exes was Nigerian too. So I know the whole structure in the household. No, it's no, pretty it amazing, good. but it works though. You guys are, I think the most successful uh, black group of people in America. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, people think that, oh, uh, well, you grew up your whole life in the States. You're not really well, Nigerian. That's, you know, I think a lot of who you are is what happens in your household. Um, yes. As I said, my parents are very Nigerian. So although I was, you know, grew up in, in Edmond, Oklahoma, everything around me was Nigerian, you know. So th those values and beliefs are still, you know, they're deep in the veins and the blood. So that, that can never leave me. That's amazing, man. Knowing who you are and where you come from. I just found out that a good portion of my family is from Cameroon. Okay. So it definitely gave me a sense of pride. And, you know, I was looking up flights, but with COVID, I couldn't go, but I was going straight to Yaoundé as soon as yeah. possible. Just, uh, you know, to get in tune with that, man, because we don't have, my last name is not Johnson or Williams. <laughs> like that's, right. that's not our name. You know what I'm saying? So that's amazing to hear that side. But uh, well, now you're a professional basketball player. Was that always the plan when you was growing up or was it something, another sport or another? Well, growing up, man, uh, I grew up obviously in Nigeria. I grew up in a soccer family, yeah. a diamond soccer. So uh, that's what I played. That was my first sport playing, you know, soccer. My dad played professional. I've got family members who are professional even to this day. So, you know, that was kind of the, the, the goal for me. And as I got older, I started playing football and basketball and baseball. And uh, my dad, you know, wanted me to kind of move away from that. He kind of wanted me to move into an American sport, you know, quote unquote, American sport. So he thought that the way that they played soccer in the States was, was not the right way to play soccer. All right. I understand. You know what I'm saying? So he was like, you know, I want you to play football or basketball or baseball. So I played all three, played baseball for a couple of years, couldn't really get into it. I was 
it would that that ball was so hard to hit for me I didn't really understand I was athletic I was fast so Pete this is what I would do I would stand up there and the, I was young so the pitchers couldn't really throw st strikes mm -hmm. so I wait till they throw they threw four balls and then I'd walk and then steal every base <laughs> that's what I was doing I think I might have swung one time all year got you but, uh, then I started you know playing basketball and playing football and Initially, I was big. I was bigger than everybody. So I was initially just really good at football. Mm. And people thought, man, this is going to be the sport you can play, you know. Um, but for me, I didn't really understand football like I did basketball. You know, and athleticism can only take you so far. Right. So, right. That, you know, as I got older, I started realizing, man, I, I understand basketball, the ins and outs. And, you know, I felt like basketball was the direction that I wanted to go. And it didn't help that, you know, I wasn't a fan of just getting taking hits in football. You know, that wasn't that wasn't fun to me. So my freshman year in, in high school, I decided, man, I'm going to focus on basketball. Um, so I quit football then and then just put all my effort and focus and, into basketball. And, you know, it took off from there. See, I was backwards. Um, I understood football and baseball. I was one of the best baseball players in my state. And I started playing basketball when I was late. I just didn't have that feel. I didn't have no swag. I couldn't dance. Still to this day, I don't have no rhythm on the court. It's kind of all drill work. I just, I'm a gym yeah. rat. So yeah. um, it's kind of all drill work. But um, if you get me in a place where I got to do something where it's like some rhythm stuff, I'm screwed, bro. Yeah. But playing those sports, I feel like being a quarterback and playing shortstop my whole life, it helped me with basketball. Do you okay. think that those sports helped you? Because I'm a, I'm an advocate for playing multiple sports to take a little bit to to get to your real sport. Do you think those sports help you become a better basketball player? Well, here's the thing that I value the most is in basketball is footwork, mm -hmm. and for me, that came from soccer. See? I mean, when I was a kid, I, you know, you you see people doing the ladder work and the cone drills and things like that. I mean, that to me was just second nature. I was doing that since I was a kid in soccer, ladders, cones, footwork, all that stuff. So when I started playing basketball and I had footwork and I would work on pivots and, you know, all this stuff, people were like, oh man, that, you know, you, you're really good at that. And I said, well, I didn't really think about it. It wasn't something that I had to work on yeah. in basketball. Of course I was working on it in soccer, but I didn't really understand it at that age. Yeah. So as I got older, it just it just came to me, boom, boom, everything just came to me, the footwork, and it was easy for me to 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 move like that. So I think in that sense, it helped me for sure. Um, but like you said, being a gym rat, man, I that that's that's what I was. You know, I'm not very creative on the court. I can get to from point A to point B efficiently. You know what I'm saying? And that's kind of how I worked. And I worked out that way, is you know, working on certain moves, certain, you know, shots and things like that. I wasn't working dancing with the ball. I was working getting from point A to point B as efficiently as possible. And uh, so it's a little bit of a little bit of footwork from other sports and and a lot of a lot of drill work and, you know, being in the gym. I got you. So when you was in high school, were you like a, a big time player in uh, your area? In high school, I was, and you know, I played varsity as a freshman, which was kind of unheard of at the time. Um, so, but I was bigger than everybody. I was six two, freshman, but I, I I played the five. I played the five all growing up because I was bigger than everybody, right? Mm -hmm. And so then, I say footwork that came into play as well. You know, in, in the post, you got to you really got to work on your you know your footwork. And so, um. Yeah, I mean, I was I was good, but I really got better just by putting in work, putting in work every year. And, you know, by my senior year in, in high school, we actually won state, which was the first time we, you know, my school ever won state. It's amazing. Um, and we had a good team. We had we had a good team, but, you know, say so we won state. And then um, despite winning state, I was still a six two five man. And so going from high school to the next level, um, I only had two, divi two division one offers. What were those? I mean, that's, that's more than, that's more than Northwestern State, Louisiana. Get out of here. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, and um, 
Western Illinois. Those are my two, those are my two division one. And like I said, man, I was grateful, you know, I felt that I should have had more, but at the same time, some guys don't have any, yeah. you know? Um, so I was grateful for that. And, you know, I took, I took the opportunity. I went to Western Illinois um, and I started a whole, a whole different journey there, you know? Cause like I said, I went from six to five, man, um, I had always, I was always working on my guard skills because I knew at the next level that I wouldn't be able to play five. So I was always working on my guard skills, um, but I needed somebody to take a chance on me because they didn't see, you know, they didn't see me playing in the wing. They weren't surely weren't going to let me play in the post at six two in in Division one. Right. So I just needed somebody to take a chance on me, and uh, you know, Western Illinois did. They took a chance on me, and I went there. And it was rough at first, I'm not gonna lie. Uh, I struggled a little bit because, you know, it's just different. It's different from going from drill work to in-game situations, from drill work to practicing every day at this position now, you know, there's no, you don't have anything to fall back on now. I can't fail on the perimeter and then choose to go back in the post. You can't do that. You've got to stay on the perimeter, fail, 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 and just keep pushing forward. And, um, I actually ran, I actually had a conversation with my coach after my second, no, this was my first exhibition game. I remember we played Iowa at Iowa. And uh, I mean, it was terrible. I played awful. <sighs> I played awful. I couldn't, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know where to go. I didn't know, you know, it was, it was growing pains. And I had a coach, I had a conversation with the coach and he said, look, Obi, I think that it'd be best for you if we could put you in like a stretch four position. I said, I didn't really come here for that. You know, you told me that you would give me this chance to play the, the two, three guard and I'd be able to work on my game. And he wasn't happy about it because, you know, he had talked to the staff and he said, look, Obi, we'll, if you can guard our best player every day in practice and prove that you can play, we will let you play on the perimeter. And that's all I needed to hear. At that point, you know, what I'm saying <clears throat> I had my I had the I had my eye set on what I needed and I just I, I just hunted for it and I went for it every day, every day. And, you know, it paid off. It was it was tough. I, I, I he gave me a lot of buckets that, that year, but, you know, he, he was a great player. Uh, his name is Tommy Tyler, a great player. And he was he was kind of a guy that I looked up to. And you know, I wanted to be like him. I wanted to, he was the senior. I wanted to take his place. I was, I was there to take his place when he left. But, uh, you know, he kind of brought me under his wing and taught me what I needed to know and had confidence in me. And at the same time was, was, I don't I, I know I can't curse here, but he was just. Yeah, you can curse, you can do anything you want. Oh, he was busting my ass all, all practice. <laughs> yeah. Busting my ass all practice. So, uh, it taught me a lot, man, and I ended up being the leading scorer on that team as a freshman. And from then on, you know, it, it was just up. It was it was up from there. I got you. That's an interesting story because it's, America has a lot of basketball players, but what a lot of people don't know is that the talent is so spread it out, and you, you got a lot of guys that's. Six one playing the five. You got a lot of guys because you don't have that much people on your squad, right? Right. Because I was, I was, I went from five eight to six four in one summer. So I went from point guard to five, and they wanted me to be on the block five. <laughs> I I capped off at six six, but like you said, I knew I wasn't going. Well, I thought I was going to college to play football and baseball anyway. But the work I had to put in when I got to college. They told me to get in a triple threat. I'm like, what is that? Like, yeah. that's how I went to college. Like, no knowledge of anything. <laughs> so it's like so many players would give up and fall for their coach. But it's like I was being a five on the team. But I knew when I was at home and I was drilling, I was a two. Right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So it's, it's just so interesting to hear somebody else go through that same story. But um, you finished that Oral Roberts though, right? Yeah, so after that, so like I said, I had two Division I offers coming out of high school. Um, I wanted to stay at home. I wanted to, I wanted to go, you know, somewhere close to home, Oklahoma, Oklahoma State, Tulsa, Will Roberts. Uh, they didn't believe in me, obviously. Right. So 
I went to I went to Western Illinois. Happened to be they were in the same conference as Oral Roberts. Busted a ass too. Yeah. <laughs> I had to get up. I had to get all my licks back because I was mad that they didn't, you know, they didn't come off for me. Mm. So um played really well against them. They had a all-American battled with him. You know, I played great, he played great. Um and he was he was a senior, he was leaving after then. So they, you know, they coach came and talked to me. And he actually told me, he whispered in my ear as we were shaking hands, said, we made a mistake on you. Mm. And, you know what I'm saying? I was like, yeah, yeah, y'all did. And so after that season, Oral Roberts was moving from the Summit League to the Southland. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't conference to conference. They asked me, I mean, I chose to, to transfer. They wanted me and I was able to transfer there because they had switched conferences. Mm -hmm. So I transferred to Oral Roberts, sat out, and the next year they moved back to the summit. But you was good though. Yeah, I was good, but now yeah, I was good. But you know, the team that let me go, now I'm playing against them. You know ah. what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? I didn't have a problem with it, but they looked at me like, oh man. But I got lucky, you know, because if they were in the same conference, I probably wouldn't have been able to transfer. Mm -hmm. But the, the fact that they moved conferences, I was able to I was able to transfer. So I went to Oral Roberts, sat out, dealt with some injuries, uh, sat out my first year, came back, played four games, tore my ACL. Mm -hmm. Tough. That was <laughs> catastrophe. That was that was to me, man, I didn't know what to do at that point. That 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 almost broke me, I'm not gonna lie. Um, but you know, I picked myself together, I picked myself up, put myself together, and uh took that year off, the second year in a row off now. You know, a lot of people they transfer, they come back, they're ready, they they sit out, they come back, they're hungry to play. I was hungry as ever, but then I tore my ACL. Now I gotta sit out another year. And so, you know, I took that year to just kind of learn. Cause like I said, I had one year under my belt as a guard at Western Illinois. This was going to be my second year, but I had to sit out, which ended up being a blessing for me. Cause I was able to watch the game. I was able to learn from the sideline and see what, you know, it gave me another year to practice as a guard in a game situation without playing actual games. So I was in practice as a guard running around making all the mistakes that I needed to make to get out. You know what I'm saying? To 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 get those mistakes out the way. Um so in practice, you know, I was you know how it is like being on the I don't know what do you call it, white squad or blue squad, the the B the the B squad. Right. That was I was I was a permanent B squad guy cuz I wasn't playing. So I was just out there having fun, learning the game and Came back the next season and averaged, I think, 18 and a half, 18 and a half points. And uh, then I started kind of putting, people started noticing me, you know what I'm saying? You know, you average, you average that in college and, and you, you draw some attention. Got you. Um, so yeah. what the, the next step is one of the most interesting step for most players is how do you go from being a college player to being a pro, especially internationally. What did you reach out to agents? Does agents reach out to you? The teams reach out to you? How did you get well, going in Italy? Well, here's so for me, uh after that year, I had a my senior year, I was one of the top leading scores in the country. I was averaging 24 and a half points. Um so that made things a lot easier for me you know I think I was six in the country in scoring which that year we had a lot of people scoring I mean I'm six in the country in scoring at 24 and a half what's the number one guy averaging you know he was like at 29 I think crazy numbers that's that's when college started getting crazy people averaging 30 points a game and things like that but uh, I had a lot of agents come come and contact me you know it, it's I was blessed in that sense because not a lot of people have agents after them and that's when things get really difficult right but for me I had some agents come after me and uh 
I made a mistake for all you young guys watching this. Do not sign a multi-year deal with an agency. Don't ever do it. It's a big mistake. I did that. Um, went to Italy. I mean, my agent was a great guy, but you know, I just made the mistake of signing three years right out of college. Mm -hmm. um, so found an agency, found an agency, an agent. Uh, like I said, a good guy. He got me some NBA workouts and uh, got me a job in Italy. And I was very thankful for that. Got you. So now let's talk about, because we've talked about, you know, your upbringing, you, uh, your journey through high school, college, you dominated, you're a pro now. It's a foundation that, that was set to accomplish all those things. Let's yeah. talk about some physical fitness because this is what I'm big on. I'm big on training. I'm big on taking care of the body, taking care of the mind. That's sure. my thing. People think that I'm talented, but I don't think I'm that talented. I think I'm just more disciplined than most players yeah. as far as my routines and things. Do you have any morning routines? Morning routines. Okay. So I don't know if you know, I'm a vegetarian. Okay. Um, I've been there for, this is I think my fourth, fifth year. Mm -hmm. uh, I started off in Italy. I had always had some uh, issues with my body. I was always the guy who was always lifting and working and trying to, you know what I'm saying, trying to build my body up, right? And I went through some weight issues. I was trying to find, I was trying to find myself. That's when the injuries came. But um, I went to Italy and I ended up, you know how people say like the freshman 15, I didn't gain the freshman 15, but I was uncomfortable in the way that my body looked and was performing. Right. And this was my rookie season as a pro. So I knew, okay, this is what I want to do. I want to play basketball. What do I need to do to maximize my efficiency, right? Mm -hmm. And I knew some people, some athletes who were vegan, uh, plant-based diets. And one of my good friends, Dustin Watton, he told me, you know, th this is what I do. I can help you. Um, you know, I can give you the blueprint to, to how I do it. And this has been very beneficial for me and a lot of guys I know. So I took that and I ran with it, man. I took it. I had some non-plant-based stuff in my fridge in Italy. I went, I spent like 300 euros on just all plant-based. I come home. And at the time, like I said, I had like some chicken in the freezer and stuff like that. And uh, I didn't throw it away, but I just ate it until it ran out. And when it ran out, I didn't buy any more. And I haven't since, you know what I'm saying? So that's where I went. It wasn't really cold turkey, but pretty much cold turkey after like a few weeks. <laughs> yeah. But I, was in a, I had been injured so much that this was like the last thing for me. I had to do something for my body. I had to do something to help me, A, not be injured, B, recover faster, uh, C, be more, you know, efficient on the court. And so when you talk about, you know, what are my morning routines, it's probably a lot different than people that you guys know that are eating meat. You know, like I said, so I don't eat meat. I don't really eat cheese. I don't eat eggs, fish, you know, so wake up in the morning. Um, I try to read. I try to read every morning. Right now I'm working on some things, a book and some other things like that. So I'm writing a lot, um, get my intake of fruit and vegetables in in the morning. And then I usually, typically I don't eat until afternoon. And when I say afternoon, I mean literally after 12. I usually don't eat a meal until then. So I use the morning for water, uh, fresh natural juices, not the carton orange juices that y'all are used to. You get the vibers. Uh, yeah, <laughs> a lot of fruits and stuff like that to kind of cleanse my body and uh, make sure I'm sharp and strong. So it's like, um, so I wake up at six every morning. First really? thing I do is I drink water and I chop up an apple, or orange, maybe a kiwi or something like that. I always eat fruits and it's like, I kind of fast through that time. You say you don't eat till 12, but sure. I just kind of do like straight fruits and water. I chew on that while I journal and I just finished my book. So I'm not writing anymore, but I go straight to any side hustles that I'm doing or I make beats. So I use that time uh, with my mental time, but I noticed 
whenever I just eat the fruits in the morning, my whole day is better. I, right. I, I'll eat like some oatmeal right before I go lift in the morning or before the, sure. the morning practice. So I can have that energy and then I eat again at 12. But yeah. that that one fast of like, not I'm not even, I don't even be hungry anymore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, but it it gives me a sense of respect. It feels like like respect for humanity <laughs> kind of sort temple, of. Your temple. I mean, it's, you know what I'm yeah. saying? You're, you're really setting your temple in line with that. Right. Plus the and meditation to go along with that. It's exactly. like, I'm, and, and for, for us as athletes, I say I don't eat in the morning and I usually don't, but when we're, you know, the overseas grind is a lot is different. You know what I'm saying? You might two practices a day, lifts, things like that. So some mornings you need, I, I need to eat in the morning. You know, maybe if I have a workout at 11, Right. No, I'm not going to get back till 12 or one. Yeah. I need to eat something before, but on a, on a, you know, typically on an average day, I try to just keep the morning for cleanliness. Well, yeah. On Saturdays and Sundays, I don't eat till 12 myself. I eat till one actually. I eat every day at one. So that's kind of crazy. I really thought I was the only person doing that. <laughs> I think that's, I think those, these are keys, man. These are major keys that people don't, and that's, that's what I'm, I'm trying to, this is a story that I'm telling that, that I'll give you some insight on what I got going on here is I'm trying to give the insight to the journey of, you know, being a, a, an athlete overseas, but not just an athlete overseas, you know, an athlete who, a mindful athlete, you know, I think, I think just from, you know, I've met you a couple of times, but just from listening to you, I think you're very mindful of the mind and body and soul. And I think that that's important and to, to reach those new levels, you can't just play basketball. That's not, it's not gonna cut it. It will not cut it. You know, at the next level, being good at basketball is not good enough. Right. You know what I'm saying? So you've got to, you've got to find other avenues to better yourself, better your body, and in, and you know, thus better your game. All right. Cause um the thing is, that's why I wanted you on the show, because I feel like we need alternative role models. It's like we'll see the Kobe's and the Jordans and we see their aggressive attitude and guys think that that's what they have to do because that's where they want to go. But I'm like, you're not them. You don't have the respect they have. Bro, actually your kindness and your motivation to help someone else get better is going to go way longer than you being chirpy at the mouth. Yeah. Trying to but, beat those guys. And this is what people don't understand is those guys didn't, Kobe didn't become Kobe because he can he can make a shot and yell at his teammates for not doing, you know what I'm saying? That's not how he became Kobe. Kobe became Kobe by the things that we don't see. You know what I'm saying? Thousand and, hours. You know what I'm saying? He that's how he became Kobe. Those things that and we and we don't know a lot about it, but you hear you hear stories about, you know, the the monotony in his game and the things he Kobe would come in the gym and shoot from the same spot a thousand times. You know what I'm saying? Like the, the, the things that he does when you don't, when he, when people are not around, that's what, that's how he became Kobe. Same with Bron, you know, taking care of your body and, and those things, that's, the, that's what's overlooked nowadays. Everybody wants to go in the gym and shoot like Steph Curry and think that, you know what I'm saying? That's not, yeah. you can't wake up one day and be able to do that. That's not how it works. All right. So um, I'm glad that you're a vegetarian. Um, I went vegan last year, and man, I was averaging like 25 during that 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 time span. Yeah. But I lost like 15 pounds. Yeah. And, you know, my girl, she's pretty much still kind of vegan today. But I, I cold turkeyed it. I went from eating terrible to just eating clean, and right. I felt the best I've ever felt. Now I don't do it as much, but I plan on doing it soon as I'm finished playing basketball. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I don't. And, I don't think. I don't think that. To me, yes, I'm plant based, but to me, it's not. That's not just the end all, be all. You know, I don't think that eating meat is is bad. I think that there's certain ways to do it. I think there's clean ways to do it, and I think you know there's good ways to do it. Mm -hmm. I myself personally just choose not to. Right. You know, th this guy might eat meat and be just as healthy, and I'm okay with that. Right. You know, so. so I'm, I'm careful about how I advocate for people being plant-based because a lot of people go there and they do it completely wrong. Mm -hmm. And 
you you you're hurting yourself more than anything. And they you know? shame people. The thing for me is why I wanted to stop. I don't like. I'm kind of like the PETA guy. I don't want to wear animal clothing. I I don't mm -hmm. like seeing like dead animals. Like it was all about. Uh, I started. You know, I study a lot of mindful things. It was talking about the same issues that chicken was having. Like you're eating all of that that hysteria, how they was dying and stuff in cages. Yeah. Like all of that energy is you're consuming it. And that's why I really wanted to stop, but I, I wasn't educated. I just cold turkey. I'm like, nah, this is wrong <laughs> and I'm done. Yeah. But my recovery, I, I, I'm, I, I'm a big advocate for recovery too. And people, I do the yoga and stuff like that. And people see that, but I think my nutrition and I think you'd be able to help with this is that a big part of recovery is nutrition. And a lot of people don't like to focus on that. That is, I mean, I would say 100%. That's 90% of the reason why I did what I did was recovery. Like I said, I had been injured so many times. Mm. I mean, clearly something was missing there. Right. And also, you know, I've had, there's a lot of athletes in my family and a lot of them, almost all of them had to stop playing because of some type of injury. So maybe this is just me thinking or maybe, you know, but I thought to myself that, that this is something that runs in the family. Right. And you know what else runs in the family? Eating goat meat and chicken <laughs> and jollof, you know what I'm saying? Eating all these foods that, these foods that not, they're not bad for you, but they're healthier foods to eat. And so I said, you know, let me just go completely left field and just change everything from anything I've ever seen before, from anything I'm used to, you know, in a Nigerian family, you know, I got a lot of, I got a lot of flack for that, you know, how are you not going to eat this and eat that and you don't miss this. And I said, look, man, you know, my health is more important than what I'm, my health is more important than enjoying whatever it is you're eating. Right, right. And if, and if what you're eating is going to make me not healthy, I don't want it. But then what you <laughs> I don't want to cut you off, but you start learning how to enjoy those food. You get very creative. <laughs> I, I mean, I don't, and it doesn't, you know, it helps because I, I was never the guy who said, I can't go without this, or I can't, I gotta have cheese, or I gotta have this, or I got that was never me. Oh, this is a big question then. Cause I've been criticized harshly for this because. I mean, I'm getting better at it now, but I've, I've been kind of on my own since I was young. Um, I tell people that people try and cook for me and I don't just eat everyone's food. And I'm not a forcer. I'm not gonna force nothing down for your feelings because <laughs> I, I eat for sports. I eat for energy. Right. right. I was like, you guys eat for enjoyment. I eat for energy. And, and based on how I'm working out, if I don't work out, I'm not eating. I'm probably going to eat some fruits or something like that. But if I know if I got a big game or a big practice or something like that, I'll eat. But I'm eating only for the energy. It's not my enjoyment, except for celebrations. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How do you deal with, like, because people really be in their feelings. Oh, my <laughs> about God, Hey, I mean, you're right. They, I, hear, I hear people say it all the time, you know, like, Oh, like you don't eat this. Oh, you get like even to this day, when I when we go on road trips and I'm eating my, you know what I'm saying, my lentils and rice and salad, whatever I'm eating, my teammates look at me like, oh man, his food looks so sad. His food looks so sad. I'm like, You're giving me nothing but life. <laughs> and I'm enjoying it. You know what I'm saying? Like, I enjoy it. You, what I eat doesn't make you shit. Why are you worried about me? You know what I'm saying? Like, uh, the people, people are worried about what I'm eating, and that that's what makes me mad. Is like, why why do you care what I eat? You know what I'm saying? If I'm if I'm not hurting nobody, I'm surely not hurting any animals. Like, what what do you what, what's your core with me? Man, you, know? you gotta you gotta link up with my boy Noe, man. He got a brand called. Oh, Eat he will, he, yeah. yeah, yeah, I follow him, bro. Yeah. There was. We used to, they used to attack him on the bus because he's eating um, what's dates and walnuts before the games and stuff like that. Yeah. He'll bring his own smoothies because he didn't want to eat the hotel. This is how I look at it. You worrying about what he's eating, but you're not worried about what you're eating. You don't know how right. this food is being prepared. You don't know where it's being prepared. One of my boys, uh, Thomas Yerkotai, playing Lil, he's like, 
tired. His fish never touched the water. He's just a straight vegetarian for sure. <laughs> He's like, we'll eat the hotel food. He'd be like, Ty, that fish never touched the water. <laughs> <For sure. laughs> so yeah. people worry about what, what like people that have alt alternative real diets, not even alter. I shouldn't, we shouldn't even call these alternate diets. These are real diets. You know what I'm saying? And it's different. But they're not worrying about what they're eating or where their food is coming from. You're eating pork and you're talking to me about the vegetarian meal that I got. Right. Like how did, where, where, you know what I'm saying? Make it make sense. How are you eating? So, I, and, and I try not to, everybody hates the angry vegan. You know what I'm saying? I try not to be that guy. I try not to, you shouldn't be eating this and you shouldn't be eating that. So I just try to stay on my own and just worry about what I'm doing. But sometimes it gets on my nerves when people are talking about what I'm eating. And I got to say, look, what do you eat? What are you eating? You don't even know what you're eating. You know what I'm saying? We go some places and people are like, oh, is this fish? Is it chicken? Is it pork? You don't know. Uh, you really don't. You know what I'm saying? Like, what are you eating? Uh, if you, you know, but I try to just, you know, I try to just stay positive about my situation, everybody's situation, because, um, you know, even amongst all their negativity. And that's the best way to go about it. But let's shift the, just a little bit. I don't, I don't want to keep you too long. Um, I don't want to get too personal, but are you in a relationship? No, I'm not. I'm not. Not because I think that, you know, even playing overseas, and this ain't just for overseas, this is just for young men, period, I feel. Um, I have this thing where I tell guys, stop dating, right? I want to know your opinion on this because. I know a lot of guys that's broke, that's trying to play <laughs> professional basketball, but yeah. they got they got joint, they got, I'm gonna say they have female after female in city after city, and they're on the phone and texting all day. And I tell them, bro, when you get about 25, 30 grand in the bank and you got a job, you work, you playing in Argentina, you playing whatever you playing, then you start dating. But while you're grinding, I think dudes chase the female more than they chase the ball sometimes and they use the excuse of I have to live life how do you navigate dating and 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 reaching your dreams because you, most players say that there's dream to play at the best level how do you manage dating because it's so easy to date <laughs> how do you manage those two things I think that I think that I don't have a problem with dating but here's my here's my take on it don't date every girl you see. Don't go around dating everybody. You know what I'm saying? I, I value relationships. I value conversation. I value good people, right? You know what I'm saying? I value people in general, but there's nothing like a good person who can hold a conversation. Right. So as you're on your journey, if you're spending your time talking with somebody, they should be bettering you in some way. You know what I'm saying? Right. So, and you should be bettering them in some way. So y'all should be moving upwards together. You don't want to be moving downwards. You don't want to be on a plateau. You want to be talking to somebody who is adding value to your life. And if you end up dating that person, well, then congratulations, because you guys are both adding value to each other's lives and you guys understand what's important, right? Mm -hmm. You know, the, the situation you get into is when you start being in all these different situations, these random situations that end up in the end, wasting your time. You don't ever want to feel like you wasted your time. So, you know, date who you want to date, but just make sure that you're, you're mentally on the right path and they are also mentally on the right path. So you guys aren't in each other's way. Gotcha. That's what I feel about it. I appreciate that, man. Last, last little question, um, unless you got something else you want to add, but playing for the, you play for the Nigerian national team, right? Yep. Give me that feeling, bro. I need to know what that feels like. <laughs> <laughs> I just got goosebumps when you asked me about that, man. I can't even, I'm gonna just give you a quick rundown. When I, I, since I left Nigeria, when I was three years old, I had never been back. Mm. Family goes back every Christmas and they, during Christmas is like, a, it's, a, it's a party, right? But that's, that is the heart of our season as basketball players. So I've ne I have never been able to go back. My grandpa's 109, 109, I think. Gangsta. <laughs> Walking, talking, everything. You know what I'm saying? Walking, we, we got a big house back home. Walking up the stairs, down the stairs. He's good. 
he's all his his only thing was I mean he I remember my dad he used to tell my dad like are you gonna let are you gonna let me die without seeing my grandson you know what I'm saying mm. everybody had been home but me so I joined the national team three years ago and we went back home I mean I I can't I can't explain to you what it was like man it was you know being around my my parents and hearing all the stories of my grandpa and the family and the houses we had back home and the land and what it's like and I I go back home and all of it just it all it it kind of completed me in a sense it made me understand who I was where I came from why I do the things I do why I am yes. the way I am I just saw everything and it made so much sense to me. It gave me so much clarity. And so I, you know, and it's nothing like what you're taught in America, in the States. Bro, it's crazy. <laughs> I mean, why, why they chose, why they choose to teach that about Africa, I, I can't understand. Divide and conquer. They know what a real strength is. Why they show Africa in such a way that makes us look poor when we are the richest continent in the world? I I can't understand, you know. But I went back home and and it just put me at so much. I it put me at so much peace, man. And and I was so thankful. And even since then, I've been back a few times. But when I go home, it's it's this is your people. I mean, you're, you're, everybody there is black. Nobody's looking at you like you're an outsider. Nobody looks at you like you don't belong. Nobody, you know what I'm saying? Every, it's just, it, it is literally the definition of love when you go back home. Um, and being, and then being with the, the, with the national team, you go back home and you are so respected Mm -hmm. because you you know you're 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 representing the country you're so respected and i you know i got to join my brothers you know that making so many connections with, with other nigerians that i never knew before but you see each other and it's like you've known each other your whole life you know you've heard people say that that's how it is when you go back home and talk to people in africa with everybody it's like you you've seen them you see them one time and it's like you guys are just family off the jump you know Nice. It, it's it's amazing man every chance that i get to go back home i will be back home every time that I get the national team calls i will go whether it's in Af in nigeria we were supposed to go to cameroon next month but it got changed to tunisia we're okay. going to tunisia mali rwanda i was just in rwanda two months ago uh ghana i mean any chance i get to go back to africa i'm going yeah you know? That was my plan, man. My plan was I'm not going on no more vacations unless it's my girl's Togolese. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, I'm not going on no more vacations. I want to, that's my vacation spots. I want to go to all these exotic places in Africa. You know what I'm saying? Because it's when I found, I spent thousands of dollars trying to find my, my, my lineage where I could, like, I was paying for like court documents, trying yeah. to find out where my grandpa and them came from and it traced back to Cameroon. My daddy's side, we got Indian, so it kind of like it kind of got mixed up a little bit. I kind of came to a halt, but I'm still working on it. But my family would call me crazy. It was like, okay, now what? I'm like, bro, do you know the clarity I have? The way I speak don't sound crazy anymore because I understand what it comes from. When I'm looking at these dudes in France and I see they're from Cameroon, I see the facial structures. I'm like, yo, these dudes look like me. <laughs> I go back home and I see, like, I can tell you what they look like in Rwanda. I can tell you what they look like in Sudan, in Nigeria. I look at him and I can tell he's from Ghana. You know what I'm saying? Like, I know where everybody's from when I'm when I'm looking at people. And that, that to me is amazing, like you said, man. It's clarity. I'm from the slave slot. I'm from the South. I'm from Louisiana. Yeah. I got five slave plantations in my community alone. So we live in the same community. what that mean? The slaves just moved next door. We couldn't leave. <laughs> so you're looking at them, the descendants yeah. of slaves. So it's like, but all of our, our diet is all African and we don't even know it. Yeah. But as I do more research on Africa, I realize, oh, gumbo is not pronounced gumbo, it's yumbo or something like that. Yeah. In Africa, it's like the way, all of our food is prepared the same way it's prepared in Africa. And we think that it's Louisiana written. No, <laughs> no. I mean, it, every everything in the states, everything. I believe that everything came from Africa. And the world is influenced. 
And when I played in Japan, they didn't show that poor side of Africa. They right. showed prosperity in Africa. That's what it is. I mean, that that's where that's where everything that we have in the states comes from. Right. You know, and it's great to go to Europe and because I, I love culture, man. I love culture. I, that's why I'm learning my own language. You know, the Igbo language they say is going to be deceased in like 50 years or something like that. I'm trying to I'm trying to learn my language because I want it to live on with me and you know mm -hmm. my kids and things like that. So that's that's another thing that I got going on. But I think it's important, man, to know where you're from. And you know, growing up, I wanted to speak Spanish. I wanted to speak Italian. You know, I want to speak all these things. I got overseas. And I'm playing in Italy, I try to learn Italian. I'm playing in Spain, I try to learn Spain, Spanish. I'm in France, I'm trying to learn French. Mm -hmm. And I don't know where I'm gonna end up. Yes, yes, I'm pretty good at those languages, but one thing that'll never leave me is my language. So why am I not learning my language? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I always go when, home. When I'm 100 years old, I will always have a house in Nigeria with my people who are speaking Igbo. Why do I not learn? You know, so that's that was my thing when I learned during quarantine. I just went through this whole, you know, finding process of myself. And that's one thing that I said, OK, from now on, I'm going to start taking these classes. I got a tutor, you know, and I'm going to learn my language because it'll never leave me. That's amazing, bro. That's amazing. Yes, yeah. I don't know. I don't even know what to ask after that, bro. Anything else you got you want to share? No, man. I <laughs> I appreciate you for having me here, man. I, I, you know, the chance to share my story and, you know, get to know, get to know you a little bit better. You know, I, I appreciate it. Already, man. We got to stay locked in though, bro. Uh, got, that was my guy, Obi. We appreciate him for coming on. Thanks again, bro. Uh, Till next time, y'all, please like and subscribe to this channel and please uh, subscribe on the podcast so that we can start sharing this a little bit more and making this bigger. Thank you guys for listening. Until next time, live a truth life and make them pay. All right.